it's supposed to make a grand entrance all together. <laughs> you can tell we didn't rehearse this. I ordered that myself. He wouldn't let me bring it in. He wanted to show up. He just show up. Uh, Where are you sitting here? <laughs> Thank you, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here with us tonight. You know, thank you to our elected officials uh, for taking the busy time, the time out of your busy days, to be here to have this important discussion. Uh, last week, the Republican State Leadership Committee launched uh, the Right Leaders Network, uh, which is our doubling down uh, on our commitment to recruitment and training uh, to find you know candidates who are from their communities, who look like their communities, who speak like their communities, uh, because we know that's the only way the Republican Party can grow and move forward. And so that's what tonight is about, is laying out that vision. Uh, so we're excited to be here. Uh, we believe this starts at the state level. Uh, we've got some great partners here with us, the RNC, the NRCC, the NRSC, uh, the RGA. Uh, we have groups like Winning for Women for being here. Uh, even though they do like to take uh, our candidates, our state level candidates who run for higher office uh, with Congressman Hitz and Congressman Kim, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. We believe that you are where you need to be. Um, so, you know, we, we are committed to this. We know this is a big effort. Uh, we've all got to row in the same direction. And so that's why we're here tonight. So without, with that, I'll introduce our moderator, uh, former governor of uh, Puerto Rico, Luis Fortunio. Thank you. Thank you, Dee. <laughs> I'm truly honored to be uh, in the company of such great leaders, and I want to thank them all for, for being here. Uh, for over a decade, RSLC has been active in recruiting and assisting uh, getting elected uh, female candidates as well as minority candidates. But today, we, you know, we're announcing uh, the Right Leaders Network, which is, will be a mentoring program for all those candidates that may be thinking about running or may need a push to run or, or may actually want to talk to someone that has done it before. And our leaders, all of them, started at the state level and that then you know they are now at the federal level and they're known by everyone i don't know how they can walk around airports uh, uh you know given uh, how well they're known by by everyone very I'll easily very easily <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, are you darius rucker no <laughs> <laughs> There you go. always offended when he hears that. They think I'm, they think I'm Mario Lopez. <laughs> <laughs> Hola. So uh, that, that, that shows how, you know, why they get elected so easily. You know, they're so personable. I, I want to formally introduce them. First, uh, to my left here, I have uh, Senator uh, Marsha Blackburn. Uh, really, uh, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. Senator Marco Rubio uh, from Florida. We have Congresswoman uh, Ashley Henson from Iowa. And last but not least, uh, from California, great state of California, Sen uh, Congresswoman Young Kim. Forever Young Kim, good to see you. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to start by, by asking you, Senator, if I may. Uh, uh, oftentimes we see that it's very difficult, especially difficult for women to decide yes. to run. Uh, once they get elected, normally they do a much better job th than men. But uh, anyway, yeah. uh, it's very difficult. How did you take that first leap into politics, and, and how, how difficult was it? Well, it's going to be difficult. So you just go ahead and make up your mind that it is going to be a difficult lift. But a big part of it is getting your mind right and making that commitment. And by the way, right now, every one of you that are thinking about running as a Republican, I want you to do this. I want you to write down G-O-P. And I want you to remember it is not grand old party. I am from Nashville. And there is nothing grand and old that is cool except the Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> so I want you to talk about our party as the Great Opportunity Party yeah. because that is what we yeah. are all about. And that's the type thing you keep that focus of the fact that this is not about you. It is about your children and grandchildren. It is about a better America for all citizens. 
and opportunity for all, everyone being able to protect their freedoms. So a big part of it is the mind game that you play with yourself. But if you're committed, if you're determined, if you say, hey, I want somebody to help me figure this out, if I could really be a candidate, that's what this network is all about, and that's what people are here. So get your mind right, get your issues set right, and then find somebody who will help walk with you through this process, because it's tough. Not everybody's been on TV like Ashley Henson has. <laughs> uh, not everybody has a, a group of friends that would be help them with fundraising. A lot of times you have to kind of pull all of this together for yourself, but if you're committed, you'll do it. Thank you uh, for that. I, I, if I may, I, I want to ask uh, both Senator Scott and Rubio, Oftentimes also, if you come from a minority group, it may be uh, difficult to raise funds uh, for your first raise to get the exposure necessary. How do you do it? Good question. You just raised nine million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was before Marco the, was oh, the before speaker of the House yeah, in Florida. The, so, yeah, you know. I, I will say that it can be more challenging, depending on your background, to raise money and to become known in the community. I remember that when I was running for the state house, I thought raising twenty-five to hundred thousand dollars was more money than I could ever imagine raising. It yeah. seemed like a mountain that was too high to climb. Uh, and what I did was like, you, you do what you do in sales, which is you start by sharing your story. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a story to tell, people will lean in a little bit. And having grown up in a single parent household, mired in poverty, hopeless for much of my young life, when I start talking about that, I hear people feel it and, and people understand it because we've all had challenges and tragedies in our lives. And one of the ways that I found I could build a team was around the misery at one point that became a message at another point that allowed me to be a messenger for those of us who had a shared burden at some point in our lives. And the good news is that in America, within three generations, within your family, my family, all, we've all had that same kind of burden on our shoulders. That actually leads to more money as well. Because the truth is that when your friends lean in, they're willing to do what they were not going to do before they heard the whole story, before they felt the mission, a sense of urgency that comes with who you are. When people feel that, they want to invest in something. People don't want to give you money. People want to invest in something bigger than themselves. That should be us first. We should lead by examples. But once we do that, we should anticipate that others are going to want to lean in with you and share that story with others. And that's how we were able to build a very diverse team when we ran for uh, the State House. Thank you, Senator Ruiz. Yeah, I think a couple of things uh, to echo what, what Tim just said about it. Um, the, the first is that look, it's a lot easier to raise money if you have this big network of people that your family knows and you know you went to some elite school and all your friends have gone off to make a bunch of money and maybe you've made a bunch of money. And so that, there's no doubt about it. But I think to sort of crystallize what, what Tim was just saying, there used to be this adage in politics that momentum I mean, money leads to momentum. You raise a bunch of money and that gets you momentum. I think it's become the reverse. I think now it's the momentum that leads to the money yes. instead of the money leading to the mm -hmm. momentum. So when I ran, you know, obviously for State House, it's one thing because you're largely just knocking on doors. You need to raise some money. But when I ran for Senate for the first time, my opponent was the sitting governor of Florida, a Republican, who at the time was at, you know, 70% approval rating. And nobody thought I could win. I mean, there was like, Five people that thought I could win, but they all lived in my house, and four of them at the time, <laughs> and four of them were under the age of ten at the time. So, uh, <laughs> but everybody else thought that I was going to lose. But what happened is we were able to nationalize it in the way that we were able to get people to start getting excited about the race, the way you know Tim described. So you got to start early. That's the one thing I would say. I mean, if you're planning to get in without the advantage of money being built in, you know, don't announce in June for an election that's in September or October or November. Um, because it does take time to build that. But your story will inspire people to get involved. And I think that's easier, not easy, but it's easier than it's probably ever been, given the fact that, that we now you know, can communicate directly with people and, and get things going that way. Thank you, thank you for those insights. I, if I may, I'm gonna ask uh, Congresswomen Hinson and, and Young, uh, uh, who do you lean in on for that first race? Uh, and how do you make that decision, you know, and, and, and did that 
person or set of persons were they key in, in your decision making at that first race? Well, I, I would first start by saying um, when I ran, I had to actually give up my job. And a lot of legislators, when they run for state house, um, they're able to keep their day job and then serve part time. So because I was um, on the air as a journalist, I had to make that very tough decision uh, to give up my career uh, fully to do this job. Um, so we, my husband and I had a lot of soul searching conversations. He decided he's in sales. And so he decided, OK, well, I got to go sell some more insurance, I guess, um, which I was like, great job, honey. But I think I also learned some really good lessons yeah. from being in sales. And um, that's the, the answer is if you don't ask, the answer is always no. Um, that applies absolutely to, to politics. And it also applies to asking for help from people. Um, you have to be willing to ask for help. And with mentors and those relationships, it's, it's incredibly important. So in my first campaign, um, Speaker Linda Upmeyer in Iowa was sitting across the table from me in my kitchen, giving me the hard sell about why I should run and step up and do it. And of course, I had all this apprehension. She gave me her cell phone number. And I might have abused it during the campaign <laughs> process because there is no manual for how to step up and run for office. Um, there's no guidebook other than raise money and knock on doors. And you, you got to do that. But nobody understands what it's like to run for office more than someone else who's done it. And um, there's just a, a wealth of knowledge that can come from leaning in on people who've been there and, and done it themselves. So yeah, I, I called Linda a lot. I still call Linda a lot. And I think it's, it's really important to to have those relationships and those friendships because they not, not only help you become a better legislator, but they help get you through it um, and all the challenges that present themselves. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that question. Um, as you know, I first worked uh, for a former chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, at Royce. And uh, over two decades, uh, working alongside him, representing the district, I've had the fortune of getting to know the great people of the district in the community. And uh, uh, you know, Ed Royce has been, a, continues to be my mentor. But during the 20 plus years of my opportunity of working with him, I had the opportunity to get to know uh, former uh, Secretary Condoleezza Rice, uh, Ambassador Nikki Haley, and of course, along the way, uh, you know, many, many impressive Asian Americans like Elaine Chow, uh, first African American to be in the position that um, Condoleezza Rice had, it has given me great inspiration. And watching them, seeing them, and see how they have gone to the places where normally the um, woman, you know, didn't consider going, uh, doing the the things that they did. I told myself, hey, you know, someday I may, I can do this. And sure enough, you know, I stuck to it and built on the network that I had and established while I was working as a longtime congressional staffer. But these are the opportunities that gave me the courage when in 2012 in Orange County, Orange County, supposedly very conservative county, when we lost a state assembly seat to a Democrat, we had lost the two-thirds supermajority. And I told myself and I told my boss, it's usually the way it happened is Sometimes the opportunity comes when you least expect it. Just as we do at every election cycle, we were just sitting down having coffee, and Ed Royce would talk to me and say, you know, Young, we got to find a candidate to take back that assembly seat. And I said, sure, boss. Let me think about it and go start going to work on this. And he said, look no further. I think we have a candidate. <laughs> that was the beginning of me running for office. So I left his office in 2013 to run for state assembly. So that was my very first run for elected position. But I don't know what got over me. Either you are really crazy and hard worker, or you just don't know, but you just, you just do it. As um, Senator you know, Marsha, you said, when you think that you want to do something, don't think twice. Just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Everything will follow. Your question about how you raise money, the money will follow when people see how hard you look. And you know what? Never take no for an answer when you call people to help me out. Because you're not asking money to put in your pocket. You're asking money to be used so that we can elect the right people for the right position to make a difference in our community. And that starts right there starting at the local level to the county level, state, and now look, I'm the first elected Korean American 
Republican woman to serve in California State Assembly, and now I'm one of the first three Korean Americans and one of the only two Korean American Republicans, one of only two Asian Americans serving in the United States Congress. Think about that. So just do it. Thank you. I, it, I'd like to throw a question to everyone here. Uh, why is the, having the right messenger in addition to the right message important? Why, why would you say it is, you know, like female candidates uh, that, you know, that, that look up to you all or, or minority candidates that look up to you as well? What, why is that important? Do you want to go back to us, anyone? Yeah, anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's as simple as just authenticity is what comes with the right messenger, right? I think people, especially voters, uh, they respect people who are themselves and who fit their district and who who meet those needs. And I think ultimately, you talk about the message and how important that is. We we obviously have to do a good job of getting that message out, but um, people really respect authenticity, and I think that comes with the right messenger. I mean, I don't. I think it's as simple as that. That's what there, I would say. The Republican Party has a great message, right? I mean, we are all for smaller government by giving the individuals the opportunity and the freedom to exercise their mind. And as Senator Marsha Blackburn, you stole my line. <laughs> I call GOP, not the Grand Old Party, but Grand Opportunity Party, and I'm Absolutely. with you on this. Yes. And this is how an immigrant like me from South Korea, when I was a very young girl, not even a teenager, 12 years old coming over here. Who would have thought many decades later that I would be doing this? But in the district that I represent, it's one of the most diverse district. So having a great message, the party that I belong to, but if you don't have the right messenger to get that message to the people, average Jane Doe, average Jane Doe and Jane John Kim, by the way. <laughs> You've got to get the message. You've got to be able to look like the district, talk like the district, so they can relate to you. Look, I ran in a district just like um, in 2020, Joe Biden won by 10 percentage points over President Trump, but I still won. And my district is D plus five. And I attribute that to our persistence, of course, staying in there, being grounded, telling the diverse community, I'm one of you. I look like you, and by golly, I talk like you. <laughs> I talk about women's issues, and a lot of people say women's issues are democratic issues. No, it's not. Coming from a woman's perspective, I can talk to the woman and relate to them. I talk about immigration reform. I am an immigrant. I've come here through the legal process, so I talk about the legal and fair and compassionate reform that we need. And anything that undermines the legal immigration, such as what we're seeing right now, this is a message. Coming from somebody like me talking about immigration reform, it relates to the people. It relates and gives the, I guess, the credibility. So I think having a good message is important, but the messenger is just as important. I think what Ashley said was really important as well, which is the authenticity of your message. So for me, I, I always say, having been in the insurance business for, for 20 plus years, yeah, always have something good to say, say it well, but also know your audience. Knowing your audience does not mean that your audience looks like you. That, that, that's important sometimes, especially if you're talking about specific issues that we as the conservative party need to address. It's certainly gonna be helpful to have you talking about the issue of immigration. But truth be told, for most Americans in most districts, what they're looking for really is the content of your character, not the color of your skin. They wanna hear your story because it should hopefully reflect their story. And so when we're looking for the right messenger, what we're really looking for is someone when they finish talking, your head is saying, yeah, me too. I found that in, in my district for Congress, when I was running for Congress in Charleston, it was, the, you know, if, if you know any American history, you probably know that Charleston is the birthplace of the Civil War, first shots fired. Uh, if you know anything about political history, you probably know that Strom Thurmond was a pretty powerful person. Anyone heard of Strom Thurmond? Okay, just wanted to make sure y'all were not asleep. This is good. This is good. Uh, running against Strom Thurmond's son as an African American in Charleston, South Carolina, for a Republican congressional district was a daunting and scary task. But what occurred is that the 
people in Charleston and throughout the first congressional district wanted someone that they had confidence in, not someone who necessarily looked like them in, in a 75 or 78 percent white district against a very good person. Paul and I are still friends uh, to this day. I was able to be successful because I presented a message that resonated with who they were. Uh, sometimes we as candidates think it's really about us, so we talk about our amazing you know, reputation or, or, or our resume. Truth be told, most people are most interested in their family and their kids, not you. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we remember it's that, we're probably going to be mm -hmm. a lot better off <laughs> when budget. understanding the importance of the messenger, the message, and the audience that that message will resonate in. Because mm -hmm. it's yeah. not about Very us. True. That's right. That's exactly right. It isn't. And I think it's so important to keep that in mind uh, that uh, people don't like I, I, I. And they like for you to talk with them, not at them, not to them, but to talk mm -hmm. with them about what they're facing every single day. And sometimes we as Republicans are really, really good on the technical, but where we drop the ball is on that emotional tie. And let me just give you one quick example. Uh, I had talked last week to a young mom who wants to have another baby and does not want the vaccine. And she is the sole source provider for her family. And her company that she works for is a government contractor. Now. You know, it would be easy to go out there and say, I'm against the mandate, I'm against the mandate, mandate is bad, Joe Biden is overreaching. But it is much more powerful to talk about having a federal vaccine mandate would take away the ability of thousands of young women in this country to provide for their family, to put food on the table, because that's their story. And, you know, candidates are, and those of us that are in the political process, it is just so important to realize, just as Tim was saying, people really want to know kind of what your philosophy of life and government is, kind of what makes you tick, but then how that relates to them and what they're facing every single day. And I think that's one of the most important things that you can do is to remember this is not about you. It is about the people that you are seeking to represent. Yeah, what, what I could add to that, and maybe it's the most important thing to sort of tackle head on, is this whole notion of identity, which has become a, a big issue in American politics. And I think central to many of the debates we have is what some would call identity politics. and and and. So I remember the summer watching the Olympics. I don't know, some of the events, some of the events I don't, I didn't even know they were sports, but some of them I watched. <laughs> and, and it Running struck, in high heels should be an Olympics. I think oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, and uh, so. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Marco, I now challenge you. you. Know, I really? challenge you to a race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but um, <laughs> But when, and, and I watched the Olympics, and, I, and I, it struck me that there were um, there were no Smiths. This is not picking on any country, but you have to pick. I have to pick on one because you have to find one to, to use as an example. Uh, there were no Smiths, I don't think, on any of the Spanish national team, Spain. But there were Fernandeses on the U Team USA. Mm -hmm. and, in fact, if you looked at Team USA, depending on the event, and you just didn't know that individual could be from anywhere on the planet. The only reason you knew they were from here is because they had a Team USA logo, which tells you that what's so unique about the American identity is it's not a skin color. It never has been, never should have been. It's not an ethnicity. It's not the pronunciation of your last name. It's not where your parents came from. What's so unique and special about the American identity is that we are literally people from every corner of this planet or their descendants who somehow can share the common identity of America. And we take that for granted. Look at the, this room right now reflects it. Mm -hmm. Our politics should reflect that. If it isn't, then it's not truly representative. Right. And that's the identity that matters. But let me tell you why that matters. Because so 
you know, if you looked at the people who sort of go through the, you know, the checkoff cards, Marco, Cuban American senator from Miami. That says some about me. That's only part of who I am. Yes, I am. Uh, I grew, grew up and have been raised around a community of exiles and refugees. Does that impact how I represent the state of Florida? Absolutely, it does. It's why I hate dictators. Okay, it's why I'm banned from seven countries, maybe eight. It depends. I'm not sure where I stand on, with Argentina, but but it's why I hate dictators. <laughs> it's why I go after these. It's also why I'm so. Um, um, resistant to ideas about how governments can be involved in every aspect of our lives because I was raised around people who saw a government divide a society against each other, mm -hmm. engage politics in the agenda and every aspect of life and silence, censor and punish anyone who dared speak out against them. So yeah, I'm a little sensitive about that stuff because I grew up around people. But that's not the end of my identity. I'm also a father. I'm also a husband, I'm also a homeowner, I'm also the son of a bartender and a maid who worked long hours and barely made, you know, more, today they wouldn't be able to afford the kind of life they lived in the 70s and 80s in this country, but they owned a home and retired with dignity, the American dream, and that's part of who I am as well. And so what's so unique about our system of government is you know who the people are that govern China. They're chosen when they're very young from the certain families, they come up the party system, and they're promoted. For much of human history, the people who govern the country were either the children, the, usually the son of the king, or whoever killed the king got to be the king. And uh, not here. We are supposed to basically be choosing our, uh, our representatives in this republic from real people that live in the real world and know what life is like in the real world. And so if, you're part, if our party and the country and its politics do not reflect that, then it's not truly representative not just because of the color of your skin, not just because of your ethnicity, but because of your life experience. Your life experience needs to and should be some of the biggest things that influence you in the decisions you make on behalf of people. And, uh, and for the Republican Party to truly be a majority movement in this country, it has to reflect that. And we need people to run from diverse backgrounds who can bring diverse life experience mm -hmm. that isn't just about the color of your skin and your ethnicity. It's about everything you've gone through up to this point and everything you've grown up around. Thank you. Uh, can we talk about policies? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we talked about we talked about uh, the uh, the messengers. But we're talking about the, the message, and let's bring this discussion to 2021. And there are a number of issues that are out there uh, that are being discussed that could change our way of life forever if, if they go through with some of that. Can you talk about some of those policies that reflect Republican values that should resonate well with female voters, with minority voters, uh, so that we, we can, and that should be actually promoted by our candidates in every single state of the country? Sure. You want me to start? Uh, whomever. I'll, I'll tell you, you right now. Yeah, number one, if you, if you basically spend 20 years inculcating in children that their country is an evil, systemically racist country that you should be embarrassed about its history, what do you think you're going to have 20 years from now? Number one, you're lying to them. It's not a perfect country. Our history is not perfect. It's just better than anybody else's. But number two is what do you think you're going to produce if you do that? So we should care about that. I think if you spend, I don't care if you spend 3.5 trillion or you cut the number of years from five to three and spend $1 trillion. If you codify socialism by injecting the federal government in every aspect of our lives, there's no way you're ever gonna root that out. These programs once in place are very difficult to remove. I think those are two pretty big issues right there. And, and, uh, and, I, and I think they're incredibly consequential over the next year in terms of what we're gonna be talking about here. And I think there's gonna be an enormous backlash uh, mm -hmm. against it. I do think that as you look at it from the state, if you're looking for running for school district or county council or a state legislature position, uh, in addition to Senate and House, one of the issues that should permeate everywhere that you are is the issue of education equality. Mm -hmm. uh, the closest thing to magic in America is a good education. Uh, I, by the time I was in the fourth grade, I went to four different elementary schools. It was really hard for my mom to figure out where to send me to school because there's something transient about poverty. You're, you're moving a lot. And so as a party, one of the things that we should champion on every single level of government is quality education in the poorest, most marginalized zip codes in this nation. The second thing we should do is remember to protect the goose that lays the golden eggs. Our free enterprise system is the marvel of the world. It has redefined poverty worldwide. 
If we are going to be the country that leads for another century, it's going to be because we protect that goose that lays the golden eggs, and it ain't the government. It's a free enterprise system where poor kids like me can grow up and be anything I want to be. And part of that is having the margin in your paychecks as well as your schedule to reinvest the most important asset you have, your time, into other people. And then your money should follow in that same direction. So the two pillars that we should always fight for as conservatives, education equality and a free enterprise system that is the marvel of the world. And one thing that I hope everyone noticed that he said, he didn't say capitalism. He used free enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I think that is an important thing to do in communication. Uh, one thing to bear in mind, and it really builds on what they've said, if you want to talk about a group that we need to bring back to us, you're talking about women and female voters. And this year, as we look out across this country and look at races from the local, state, and federal level, the security moms are back in force. And they are going to be showing up. Issues of school choice, they are furious about mandates and lockdowns. They think the money should follow the child because it is taxpayer money, it is not government money. That money should follow the child. And they are really angry about CRT. And now that the Department of Justice has said, if you show up at a school board meeting to ask questions, mm -hmm. you're going to be labeled a domestic terrorist. We got a lot of mama bears, papa bears, grandmama bears <laughs> that are ready to yeah. go fight <laughs> on, on this one. Uh, so sounds like you know some of those mama bears. Are you a mama bear? <laughs> and uh, I think the other thing that weighs into this is other issues. These security moms, they're looking at economic security and inflation and what is happening, the price at the pump, the price at the grocery store. Chicken fingers are up 30 uh, percent. That's something that is going to hit the pocketbook. Uh, they're angry about how <laughs> Afghanistan was carried out and the fact that terrorism now is expected to be on the rise. The southern border just makes them crazy because you're talking about people coming into the country. We don't know who they are. They do not wish us well. They're bringing drugs into our communities. They are trafficking women and girls in sex trafficking. There are work crews, there are gangs. I was at the Texas Southern border last week. They've apprehended people from 88 different gangs this year in nine months. Think about that. So a lot of the issues are the way you wrap it is talking to women and talking to security moms who love their family more than life itself and are willing to go fight to protect it. Congresswoman yeah. Henson. I would just add, so I think we, we clearly all are on the same page on all of these issues. Mm -hmm. And um, when I you know, was trying to figure out what issues we wanted to talk about in our office, I put them into three categories. We talk about fighting for taxpayers, fighting for rural America, which often gets overlooked, mm -hmm. and then fighting for safety and security. And all of those issues, when you look at what's happening in our country right now, it's a very clear contrast between our philosophical view and the, the direction the Democrats want to take our country. And that's not only here at the federal level, that is all the way down to the local level. So for us, it's really about uh, how do we frame up these issues. In the news business, I, I like to talk about it as providing context, perspective, and relevance. Real easy, CPR. Easy to remember, right? <laughs> so it's how we frame up the issues, how we make them um, relevant to the people who are voting on these issues, who are deciding on these issues. What's the life context? A lot about storytelling, right, is what it comes down to. What is this policy going to do to your life? How is it going to make it harder for you to live your life? Um, and for us right now, that narrative is pretty simple. This country is less safe under this administration. Everything is costing more. Um, and, and the policies that are uh, making life harder for rural America are on full display. And so for us, it's about telling those stories and hitting that home. And everywhere I go in the district, people 
like I see nods here, people are nodding at home. Um, they may not come out to a school board meeting. Um, they may not come to my town hall, but they're nodding at home. And um, that I think is really, really important. Uh, you did talk about the mama bears, Marcia. <laughs> I voted in my school board election already. I hope you all go out and vote in your school board elections. And um, I think that's really, really important because all of these issues are on the ballot at the local level as well as the federal level. And if I may, before going to Congressman Young, uh, your, uh, the fact, your motherhood and the fact that you have young children, you were telling me earlier, yep. does that frame your positioning and your messaging in any, any particular way connect with those moms that are out there? Absolutely. You talk about chicken fingers being more expensive. I've got a 10 and 8 year old boy. I mean, that's the, they just eat their way through house and home. And so I think, you know, when I talk about um, gas prices, for example, I'm a mom who drives a minivan. I talk about filling up my minivan. I go grocery shopping. I understand I'm a per ounce grocery shopper, which may be a little bit nerdy, but when you're feeding a family and you have a budget, um, the federal government could learn a thing or two from how moms do their grocery shopping. Because I can tell you, we understand when everything costs more all the way from the detergent to the gas pump right and so for us it's about framing up that conversation because it does affect families like mine it affects families like yours and I think people again they're nodding because they get it because it's affecting their bottom line too I thought I was the only one but I'm glad to hear yeah. that oh, yeah. there are more people like me I'm anyway. amazed at how much my boys eat it's actually kind of <laughs> disgusting to watch sometimes but. Congresswoman Young sure is it different in California <laughs> or, or at the same everything issue? in California costs more Yep. Gas prices, we just saw like, you know, a high uh, $3.60, $3.70, some place here. They, they say that's the national uh, standard, but in California, everything is a dollar more. So the cost of the milk has gone up, gas prices have gone up, grocery shops, yes, I'm a mother of four. Granted, they're a little bit older than Ashley's. I'm also a grandma, so, so yes, now sure. I think about buying diapers. I've never, uh, you know, I, it's been a while since I bought diapers now, but I just was struck by how expensive everything is these days. So these are the everyday issues we talk to the people about. So when we talk about policies, it's not just something that we're creating out of nowhere, some, you know, some imaginary policies that we think it's, it sounds good and it will look good. We are talking about the policies that will affect the livelihoods of my house, of your house, our families, and our friends, and our relatives who live here. And policies that we work on has a long-lasting effect. So we need to be talking about those at the level that people can understand. A lot of the issues that has already been talked about, from education to job to creation, so I'm not going to go into all of those except, except tell you that when People, when, like immigrants, for example, came to America, we came here for the opportunities, the economic opportunities that will not be available from the countries that where we came from. The educational opportunities, when my parents brought me over here almost 50 years ago, growing up as the youngest of seven kids, they knew they couldn't send me to college. I not only got college degree, but look where I am right now. This is the kind of opportunity that America provides. We need to be able to tell that story. But you know what? The issue that I'm concerned about is at the higher education level. This is something I fought in California in the state legislature. Affirmative action. Harvard, Yale. They use this very interesting admission standards and they penalize hardworking students, Asian Americans, those from different communities. They have to work extra hard to get into the uh, colleges. It's not based on merit, but because of the background. That's not how it should be. So we need to be able to have a quality education that is available for all because you are working hard. I mean, what incentive is there for us parents to encourage our students to work hard because you're not going to get in there because you don't meet that certain criteria? So that's something that we need to work on. And again, Ashley mentioned, uh, it's really important, these stories that we tell it, like um, from the people's perspective that we understand. And Senator Marshall, I totally agree with you. You know, more to woman power over here. 
we got to talk like what people talk about. We are the ones raising kids, so we are the ones who understand how much the, the gallon of milk costs. We need to talk at that level. And I think uh, talking about um, you know, how we as legislators, we need to be mindful of how we spend taxpayers' money. It's not something that's given away. Our friends on the left think that everything is just given to you, but there is no value if something is given to you without hard work. So we need to talk to them about the opportunity America provides, but at the same time, it comes with the cost. That means hard work. And that's how we should be talking about our policies. Immigration is another thing I can go on and on, but I briefly touched on that. We need to value the legal immigration and anything that undermines the legal immigration because of the border crisis that we see, allowing those to cross the border because we have an immigration system that is broken, serves as a magnet, because they think that once you cross the border, hide away, nobody will find you, and every 10 years, it seems like we're talking about amnesty. We gotta do this the right way with the right message. That's another issue that I'm very passionate about, and hopefully during the time that I'm here in Washington in Congress, we can come up with some sensible, fair, compassionate immigration reform. That's wonderful, thank you. Uh, through the Right Leaders uh, Network, uh, you will be helping RSLC, you will be mentoring RSLC candidates. Uh, what are you excited about sharing with them? I mean, if, if you had one of those candidates, you know, here with you, what would you tell her or him? The list is long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, the list is long. Uh, one thing to remember, and we've talked through a lot of things that you want to, to do, and uh, kind of how to prepare yourself for this, but one thing that you always have to remember to do when you shake someone's hand and look them in the eye is ask for their vote. Ask for that vote. Because the right to vote is one of those precious, precious things that we cherish. We work by the standard one person, one vote. We work to protect elections and election integrity. So show how important that vote is how you value that vote by looking at them, shaking their hand, and saying, and I ask for your vote. Um, one thing I'm excited about by joining the Right Leaders Network and serving in the capacity as a mentor now that I'm in the office is the opportunity to recruit, identify, and help them along the way and really hold them uh, by their hands and show them the experience that I had and the challenges that I had to go through to get to where I am today. I won the seat, I mean, I won one time, I lost one time, I won one time, I lost one time, so we all go through that. But the ability to stand tall and say, it's not your fault, the environment was bad, but what do you learn from it? Every campaign teaches you a lesson. So I'm excited about sharing all of these things that I did wrong, so you don't have to go through it. There is a trail that somebody left, and I am building my, and creating my own trail. I want somebody to follow me, walk with me, push me, and get pulled by me, and work with me, so you can create your own path along the way. And I'm excited by showing how to be persistent to the point of getting on people's nerves and saying, I'm not gonna take no for granted. I mean, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. The maximum you can give to my campaign is $2,900. <laughs> if you're gonna give me $1,000 today, you know I'm gonna call you again until you max out. <laughs> so is how many times you wanna be bugged by me? So just get it over with because you're gonna do that anyway. So just be persistent, right? I'm excited to take somebody under my ring and work as a mentor mentee. So call my office. <laughs> <laughs> I think the one thing I, I, I'd say if, uh, 
having been a mentee and now looking at an opportunity to perhaps be a mentor, one of the first questions I'd ask is, what makes you sad? And then the second question I'm going to ask you is, what really excites you? Because for me to understand your passion for public service, I need to know what motivates you. Uh, if you're not motivated, when you're, when you're walking by a situation uh, and it calls you, it, it just kind of stabs you in the side a little bit and you're, you feel empathy for that situation, that is a great opportunity for me to uncover where your motivation comes from. And when I understand what excites you, it, it's again another chance for me to understand what motivates you. Because designing the right atmosphere and the right platform for a candidate is all about what, where, where is the pain that motivates you and where is the success that allows you to reinvest in other people's lives. And once we uncover that, then we start building a framework for your success story. Uh, and if, if it doesn't fit your community, that will be obvious as well. So we should start with what really excites you and what causes you to pause and feel the pain that is so obviously in front of you. Yeah, the only the, the, the two pieces of advice I would give is the first is um, there's not really, I mean, politics is not glamorous. I mean, it's not like what you see on TV, um, unlike contrary to what I read on Facebook, we don't get our salaries for the rest of our lives. Um, after what? <laughs> <laughs> Peace. <laughs> um, and, and look, I'm not telling you that it's the worst thing in the world, but there are things you give up to do this, and that people need to be cognizant of that. At, assuming that that's what you want to do, if this is something you really want to do, you should. it's never been easier to be an unconventional, non-traditional candidate. I'm not talking about uh, ethnic uh, identity or racial identity. I'm just talking about your background. Mm -hmm. It used to be, right, that you, to order to run for something, you have to have been at somewhere else, right? You have to run for this, and then you have to run for that, and you have to run for the other. And that's just not true anymore. I think the opposite is true. I think in many ways what's being rewarded by voters is genuineness and authenticity. And frankly, we're at a point in American po political history where not having held office is, is the advantage. People s seem to want people in the process that are new without that sort of background. And, and I, so I think a lot of times people are discouraged by running because the first person you go talk to is someone who's been involved, pol involved in politics for 20 years, and they give you this old school advice about you need to raise a bunch of money and you need to do this and, and you need to, you, maybe you should run for something else first. It's pretty, I mean, if you want to do something, you should run for it. Like, don't run for this because you want to run for something else later. And you, if, whatever you want to be, just run for it. The worst thing that could happen is you'll lose. The good news is that in America, the loser doesn't die. Like, there are countries where, like, the loser of an election dies, <laughs> literally dies or has to leave a country. In America, you don't. But I can tell you, 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 you can't win if you don't play. And, and, uh, and that's an important thing. So, and most of the time, look, I've, I've, I, I ran for president. I, I didn't win. But I learned it a lot. Like, I'm mm -hmm. grateful I did it because I believe I've been a better senator for it. Mm -hmm. I was exposed to things and people that I'd never met before, never seen. And, and so there's nothing negative that can come from that. And, but I think many cases people will win. And, uh, and I think that a lot of people get discouraged from running because, frankly, they look at the people that are in office and they, they conclude that it, that it takes a, a whole bunch of insider stuff that they just don't have access to. That's just not true anymore. It really isn't. Senator, proud to have been a Rubio delegate. <laughs> yeah, anyway. so, so, well, and uh, you know, Puerto Rico and Minnesota, two of the smartest places in America. <laughs> <laughs> I would just kind of round that out by saying, I mean, uh, Senator Rubio talked about this too, and I said it earlier, but authenticity really yeah. is important, and I, I think I would preach that all day long to candidates because I think there is this uh, pedestal that people put candidates on of perfection and it's unattainable and we're not all going to agree on every issue all the time and that's okay and I think it's okay for people to understand that I knocked 30,000 doors in each cycle as a state representative and I was out there talking to people literally on their doorsteps when it's 95 degrees you'd be amazed at what people will tell you on their doorstep um, but I think what people respect again is you tell them where you're at on an issue mm -hmm. um, and I would always tell people I may disagree with you on that try and change my mind absolutely I think that's okay to say yeah you know what you did change my mind because you added a perspective that I had not considered before but um, I think really making sure that people understand it's okay to be yourself it's okay to have a position on an issue that's different than someone else they may still vote for you anyway um, because they respect the fact that you were 
uh, honest and forthcoming with where you are on something. And so I think that's the, the number one thing I would tell people who are new to the political arena, who all of a sudden see a party platform that is presented to them. They deal with party activists who want you to adhere to every single plank in a party platform. That doesn't mean you can't support everything, but it's okay to have some differences of opinion there. And I think that's the, the number one thing I would say to anyone who's stepping up to run. Um, be yourself and hold true to the, the things that you are passionate about. If I may, we only have five more minutes. Uh, if I can have one minute from each one of you. Uh, no. <laughs> well, we, you can do 15 if you wish. Uh, <laughs> I speak in 30 second sound bites. I mean, that's just from being Closing in Closing yeah. thoughts. You know, if you had one of those candidates, you know, here. Closing thoughts, you know. What is it that, that, that elevator speech that, that, that you want to give to those, those mentees? I'll start and then we'll finish with Senator Marsha, right? Know your story. Build your brand. And know how to give that 30 second elevator speech so you can tell why you're running. It's very important. Um, I think it, it comes down to meeting people where they are. Go everywhere all the time. Don't be afraid to, to go talk to anybody. Um, and again, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. I think you have to run like you. You have to be you. Don't become a caricature of you that you think you need to become in order to get elected. It's so much easier to run for office when you're running based on who you are and what you believe, because then you don't have to remind yourself every morning of what to say. The stronger your why, the easier your what declare your how. What? Hold on, I gotta write it. <laughs> <laughs> that was so quick. Write it for me, write it for me. <laughs> it's too and late to uh, me. And <laughs> as, as we have said earlier, it is remembering that this is not about you. It is about the hopes and dreams of the people that you are seeking to represent. And the more they can see that you and your experience relates to them, the more authentic and true your campaign and your work as an elected official will be. The yeah. wisdom and insights that you all have shared with us today uh, are invaluable. And I'm going to go turn that thing into a poster, though. He wrote it for <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree. be raising I my offer by midnight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can we split it? I'm <laughs> salty your house. Finders man. keepers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for doing this. And I only wish I would have had you know, an opportunity to have you all as mentors when I decided to run. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and go. I'm going to go ahead and go. I'm going to go ahead and go.